What's up everybody? This is Aaron from AaronsAudioCorner.com and today I'm here to review the Dot Audio MW172. Let's do this. Don Audio has long been a well-regarded and well-revered name in the audio industry. They make car audio, they make home audio, they do OEM for companies like Volvo as well. And when I first started in car audio, which is where my roots are, Don Audio was the, the drive unit company that I looked up to in, in high regard. I thought, man, one of these days I'm going to own some Don Audio stuff. So as I got a little bit older, I was making a little bit more money. I finally got around to being able to afford the Don Audio. I think it's the Isotar 2 430 mid-range, which to be honest is probably overpriced for the caliber of performance by today's standards. But it was always one of those drive units that I wanted. And so when I had the opportunity to finally get it for my new car, I did. And I have no regrets other than, you know, my initial wallet regrets. But fast forward to now, which has been about a year, I was, I've gotten back into testing now. And some people asked if I would be interested in testing some Don Audio products. One guy sent in the MW172, which I've got today. And I said, sure, absolutely. I'd be, be interested in testing that myself. The specs from Don Audio don't have this driver used as having a lot of maximum or having a lot of uh, mechanical or linear one-way excursion. I think the linear one-way excursion is about four and a half millimeters. They stated as peak to peak at nine millimeters, but I was kind of hoping that there would be a little bit more throw than what they were advertising in their spec. Unfortunately, that's not the case. Now, that's not a huge, huge deal when you're talking mid-base application if you don't plan to cross too low but in car audio there's this idea that you need to cross really really low for mid bass and a lot of people would try to run a you know seven or an eight inch mid bass down to 40 hertz which i don't necessarily advise i know some people do that some of my best friends do that and they'll tell me all day that i'm crazy for saying not to do that but it's just my personal opinion i don't necessarily advise doing that but regardless of how i feel about how low you should cross your mid bass it is important how much excursion you have and if you don't have a lot of linear throw, which by Klippel standards is a measure of 10% total harmonic distortion. So if you don't have a lot of linear throw, then as you play louder and play lower, obviously you're going to get more distortion on the low end, and that's not a good thing. But we'll get to that in a little bit. Right now, let's talk about the drive unit itself. This is advertised as a 8-inch mid-bass, mid-woofer. And it is a very nice looking driver, if I say so myself. I mean, just as soon as I got this out of the box, I was impressed. I actually walked over to my car door and did one of these things. Oh, let's see if it'll fit in there, you know, because if it will, then it won't take much, but a plasma cutter or, you know, a jigsaw to, to make some extra room if I, if I can make it fit. But anyway, um, it's, yeah, it's just a, it's a beautiful, beautiful drive unit. It's a large voice coil. I don't know what the, the voice coil size is on this. I probably should have looked it up, but you know, I'm going to guess it's probably two inches or so. Um, and Don is, is known for having a large voice coil so they can display some heat off the voice coil and you can throw some power at it and, and give it some legs to run. Unfortunately, you can throw a lot of power at this thing, but it doesn't have the excursion to, to keep up with a lot, a lot of power unless you put a high pass filter on it, you know, 80 or 100 hertz, somewhere in that ballpark with a, maybe a steep slope. But again, we'll get to that in a little bit. But yeah, let's just look at the drive unit. So I'm going to spin it around for you. And you can see, again, the voice coil is quite large. It's got a large vent in the back with mesh protecting it. And when I was pegging this thing on my Clipple Pro Stand or Pro Driver Stand, you could just you could see paper. I actually have some pieces of paper behind the Pro Driver Stand. You can see the paper just waving around. I thought, well, that's interesting. So I put my hand behind the... Uh, behind the pole vent and I felt the air coming out of that. I was like, that's pretty cool. So um, one thing I'll point out real fast is this hologram sticker on Don Audio. There are some fakes. I don't know if it's still like this anymore, but when I first got into car audio, there was a, a racket of fake Don Audio drivers. And the idea was that if you ordered one off eBay that didn't have that holographic sticker on it, then you got a fake. So I, I don't know if it's still rabid like it used to be back then, but that's just something to keep in mind if you're looking for Don Audio speakers in general. Make sure that you've got that hologram sticker on there. So, but yeah, I think that's enough of me blabbering about how cool I think this drive unit looks. Let's look at the actual data. Okay, now we're at my website, aaronsaudiocorner.com, and this is the Don Audio driver. We're gonna scroll through. 
pictures, pictures, some specs, and fill small parameters of what I measured using Clipple's Pro Driver Stand, their LPM module, and the Distortion Analyzer 2. My TS parameters are pretty much in line with what Don has on their website right now. Now going down to the area that matters the most to people. And this is where I measure and provide my results for the linear distortion displacement limits. And this is one way. Now it's important to note again that Don Audio states a linear excursion peak to peak of nine millimeters, whereas I'm providing one way. So if you take that nine millimeters and just chop it in half, you'll get about four and a half millimeters, one way linear excursion per Don Audio. I'm getting 3.3 millimeters one way linear excursion per my clipple testing. And it's important to note that again, this is linear excursion. This is an excursion limit that's maxed out based on a 10% total harmonic distortion threshold. Whereas some other companies may define their linear excursion different ways. And this provides you a good way of knowing or comparing against other speakers that are tested and their XMAX values provided to you the same way as I'm providing now with the Clipple distortion analyzer. The 3.3 millimeter limit is based on 82% drop in motor force. But it's also worth noting that the, the suspension itself is limited to about 3.4 millimeters due to the suspension limit. And that to me implies a good design, meaning that they likely designed their motor and their suspension to work in tandem and to hit their maximum linear excursion at the same point. Whereas most other drivers that I test will hit either their motor force limit or their suspension limit first. And, and usually that's by, you know, a few millimeters. So for example, let's say I test another driver and it may hit its motor force limit at three millimeters and that will be its linear excursion, but it might not hit a suspension limit until five millimeters, but it's still limited by that three millimeter motor force limitation. Moving on, these are the results of how I got to the values above and this is force factor. So quickly, I'm just gonna give you an idea of what we're doing here and how we arrive at the limitation of 3.3 millimeters. If you look at force factor, that value at rest, so coil at rest, zero millimeters, so there's no forward or backward movement, it is about, I'm gonna say 5.6 uh, NA. And using the calculator, what you do is you take that 5.6, you multiply it by 82%, so 5.6 times 0.82 gets you 4.592. So now you go over to here, you find 4.592, and you find the point on the curve that hits that first. And what I mean is, so we're just gonna say 4.5 is our value. Well, right here, if I line it up, you're at about, what is that, negative four, five, four and a half, okay? But over here at 4.5, you're actually lower, so you're at about 3.5 or so. So this is the portion of your 82% displacement limit, or motor force limit, I should say, sorry. And that's what's causing you the limitation of the 3.3 millimeters linear throw due to motor force limitation. So now that you know that, you can do that calculation on your own if you wanted to. I'm gonna skip forward. This is how you derive the suspension stiffness value. And it's important to note here that this is the inverse of CMS and CMS uses 0.75, it's at rest. So to do this value, you would take the inverse of 0.75. So you would start at 1.5 and you would basically just divide by 0.75. And let's see what that gets you, calculator. 1.5 divided by 0.75, two. So now you're at two. So if I go to two here, I'm at about 3.5 millimeters. And if I go to two over here, well, I don't see it until six, but we know it's the smallest of the two. So 3.5 millimeters is the limitation for suspension. And this is eyeballing it. Again, it was actually 3.4, so that's a rough eyeball. We know that there's not a distortion shorting ring used in this driver because as the coil moves outward, there is a decrease in inductance. And as the coil moves inward toward the magnet assembly, there is an increase in inductance. So if the driver's inductance field had a, a more symmetrical shape, maybe like a, an upside down U shape, or maybe just a flat one or something like that, that would tell us that they're using a shorting ring. But we know from this data that they are not. And we're gonna go ahead and move on. And I'm gonna blow through some of this. 
This just means that the coil is rearward set in the uh, in the gap, and you can tell by just looking at where it is. And the next thing up is their suspension, and their suspension is forward set by about I'm looking at just eyeballing this, maybe one and a half millimeters or so. Now let's move on to the on-axis linearity and impedance. This impedance profile shows a disturbance here around 65 hertz. And as we go up in frequency, there's another disturbance around one kilohertz. That one kilohertz disturbance shows up in this region. And the 65 hertz disturbance shows up as a dip in response in this region. Linearity wise, if you were using this woofer from about 100 hertz to 500 hertz or so, it's perfectly flat. I mean, it's, as far as I'm concerned. but if you want to use it from 80 hertz to 500 hertz or so, you're about one and a half dB down right here. And if you want to use it outside of that band, then you've got some issues you've got to worry about, particularly as you get to about 700 or 800 hertz, and you get this dip, this strong dip, due to the uh, impedance dip right here. And I say due to, this actually, what I believe this is due to is a uh, compliance issue, maybe between the, the cone itself, which is this portion, and how it's terminated to the surround. I don't know. But I say that based off of some other previous testing that I've done before, and usually that shows up as a uh, as a distortion element as well, and it does in this data too. So that's why I think that's the issue. I don't know that it is. That's why I think it's the issue though. And we move on off axis. You see, it's actually honestly, it's really not that bad. If this peak dip weren't right here, I would say that this is really quite good linearity and uh, off-axis behavior as well because the breakup mode that you get around this 3 to 4k region is extremely subdued usually you'll see anywhere from 10 to 15 db bumps due to breakup modes but this is really subdued quite well problem however is you still got this region right here and to me that's what kind of wrecks being able to use this as a two-way i'm not saying you absolutely cannot i'm just saying that if you were going to there are probably better options, uh, something like the ScanSpeak Illuminator for one. That's that's a good drive unit that I've always had good success with. The Revelator, and the Revelator has about the same amount of linear excursion, if not maybe a touch more, although the surface area uh, compared to this 8-inch woofer is probably not the same. So for a two-way purpose, I wouldn't bother with this driver. You think you can do better in my opinion. And we're going to keep going. And this is where we get to the distortion. So there's a lot of high distortion on the low, low end. We understand that's going to be because you don't have much linear excursion. Same graphic blown up to 10% scale. And you can see that there's this issue around 1K again and another issue around 7K. I believe, again, that this is probably a compliance issue as far as the uh, determination of the surround to the cone. And for the most part, below that, it's okay from about, we'll say, maybe... What is that 150 to 800 hertz you're you're below about one percent total harmonic distortion even at 100 db so that's pretty good i mean it's not great but it, that value is pretty good but below that man that distortion skyrockets so use a high pass filter compression this tells me at 60 hertz there's a lot of compression so i'm losing 2 db at 100 db output so 100 db minus 2 db means i'm actually getting 98 db and now we get to the bottom line so going back to basics, looking at this driver, it looks like a very, very high performance driver. For mid-base application, that's a tough one. With this limited excursion on the low end, that means you're gonna to have to either cross it a bit higher or treat it more like a mid-range slash mid-woofer than a mid-woofer or a mid-base. And just by looking at the data, I'm expecting that you're probably gonna to wanna to cross it above 80 hertz if you listen to it on the louder side of things, then maybe 90 hertz even. If you listen to it on the lower side of things, then 60 hertz, you could probably cross it that low. This all really depends on you. It depends on how loud you like to listen to music. It depends on what kind of music you like to, li like to listen to. It depends on the crossover settings that you plan to use. For example, if you have better results using a shallower crossover slope in your car to integrate to your subwoofer, then you may need to, or then you definitely would need to cross a little bit higher than you would if you were able to pull off something with like super steep slopes, like 48 dB per octave or something along those lines. So again, this really all depends on you. The linearity above 100 Hertz into 500 Hertz is superb. Uh, it's, it's pretty much really flat within that region. The sensitivity is measured at about 87 dB 
on average between 300 hertz and 3 kilohertz even though you won't use it most likely above 500 hertz i would not recommend it for a two range or two-way type speaker and by that i mean i wouldn't cross it over one kilohertz the only way I would use it for that is if you're going to use it with some horns, like some old school image dynamic horns, or you're going to use it to maybe a, a two inch dome tweeter, or I mean, which would probably be really rare to find that, but uh, a very large dome tweeter, something that can handle a one kilohertz crossover. Again, that's going to be rare. Or a wideband type application if you want to cross it at 800 hertz or so, something along those lines, you'd probably be okay. $600 a pair, I'm thinking honestly, price wise, you could probably do better if you're within a limited bandwidth. If you if you really like the uh, the high power that this speaker can take, you're willing to cross it at 80 hertz and treat it more like a typical mid bass in that regard. The eight inch surface area definitely helps provide some more displacement. Another thing going against crossing this really low is the fact that it does not use a shorting ring. And when you cross low into the FS area, then you're gonna increase the intermodulated distortion, which is a tones that's playing from the low end and also playing higher frequency at the same time. So as the low frequency is causing the cone to, or the coil to move in and out back and forth, the higher frequency content that's being created is gonna be more distorted the lower the, the speaker is having to play, the closer to FS that it's having to play. And let's look at some other things here. Distortion wise, it's a gimme. This thing is gonna have a lot of distortion below 100 Hertz simply because the linear excursion is limited to 3.3 millimeters one way. Linearity wise, the speaker really has no issues other than the issue around 1.2 kilohertz. And that again is to me more based on the surround to cone termination. So, and how, how much is that gonna be a create or create an issue? I don't know, it's a major dip in response. So, and it's a high Q value. So I don't know that you're keen to pick up on that as, as you would maybe a, uh, a spike in, in response, maybe like a 60 B spike or something like that. So the dip may not be an issue, but again, that really impedes its ability to provide higher frequency content if you wanted to use it in that regard. I'm thinking 80, 80 to 500 Hertz, something like that. Again, typical mid bass. That's something you're gonna hear from me often. That's gonna be the safe region for this speaker. And if you're a Don Audio fan, you just really wanna run it, this speaker is for you. If you're looking for a better value, this speaker is probably not for you. If you're looking for a better value, you know, $600 a pair, that's not very cheap. I'm sure that there are other eight inch drivers out there that have more linear excursion. If you're looking for just the, the 60 to 300 or the 80 to 300 Hertz region. Uh, so in that regard, I would shop around first. Nothing against this speaker, just based in my opinion on the spec. And as always, your mileage may vary. I know people are gonna say, I run this thing down to 40 hertz and it's just fine. Hey, that's you. I'm just talking about what the data is showing me based on my numerous years of experience of running drivers of seven inch to 10 inch mid bass woofers and the kicks. I've, I've run a whole lot of stuff. I'm going off what I see here in my past experience and that's my advice given to you. You can look at the data, determine what works best for you, what you want to do with it, and go from there. But again, it's just my opinion based on the data that I'm looking at. So hopefully that gives you an idea of the performance that you can expect. And that's gonna end it for my review of this speaker. If you dig what I do, give me a thumbs up. If you hate being told that this speaker has low linear excursion, you're probably gonna give me a thumbs down, whatever. Leave me a comment if you're looking forward to me testing other stuff. Make sure you subscribe and hit the notification bell and all that good stuff. And that's it. So hope you guys learned something. Thanks for the opportunity to present this to you. I'm out. Peace.